Brothers and sisters, I have no idea what Bishop Harvey did to deserve being introduced by me. Uh, because I can't say that we go back a long way together. We had a day together a couple of years ago uh, when he was visiting uh, a fledgling parish of his in Winnipeg. Uh, you have to look for reasons to come to Winnipeg in March. Uh, and he came and spent the day in our office. And uh, of course, our, our people are not very experienced uh, in a lot of church relations matters, and, and they wondered, uh, yeah, who, who is this guy? And so I, I said to them, well, this is actually the leader of the biblical Anglicans in Canada. Uh, for those of you who are here from the United States, we'll give you a slight cultural introduction. Uh, he is from St. John's, which is the provincial capital of Newfoundland, the easternmost city in North America, and so far to the east, I'm told, that it's actually closer to London, England than it is to Vancouver. Uh, I, I never mentioned it out, but I'll take their word for it. Uh, and, and I've never been to Newfoundland. The closest I got was to, to Prince Edward out Halifax, I suppose, or someplace like that. Uh, but, but I can tell, as I told to my classmate Larry Fogel, a, a one Newfoundland story. See, I really only know two people from Newfoundland. Uh, one is Bishop Harvey. Uh, and the other I only knew from television, and that's John Crosby, uh, who was the conservative member of parliament for St. John's West. And when I emigrated to Canada in the fall of 1981, I was exposed to this new cultural reality called Question Period uh, in the House of Commons every afternoon at 2 o'clock Eastern Time. Uh, it, it's a kind of a shadow of its British namesake. Uh, very, very unlike the speeches in the American Congress, which are quite canned, prepared. Uh, you know, I think they even have cue cards that say, you know, jester now and all this kind of thing. But that fall of 1981, the Canadians were to build a new embassy in Washington, D.C. And because this is the primary foreign relation of Canada, they wanted to see to it that, uh, uh, that this place would be a showplace of Canadian architecture. And so Prime Minister Trudeau at the time launched a selection campaign of, for Canadian architectural firms that would have semi-finalists and finalists, and they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars inevitably. And one day then he stands up in the House of Commons and announced that the entire selection process has been scrapped and simply drops on the House the name of the a Vancouver architectural firm that's chosen to build the embassy. It came out after question period that the head of that architectural firm was a personal friend of the Prime Minister. Well, he got away with it for one day, until the next day in the House of Commons, John Crosby stood up, speaking for the opposition, and said, Mr. Speaker, the last time we ever heard of anything like this was when the Roman Emperor Caligula <laughs> thought he could turn his own horse into a god. And Trudeau never batted an eyelash. He bounced right back and said, I have to correct the honorable member from St. John's West. The fact is that Caligula never tried to turn his horse into a god. He simply tried to appoint one of his horses as a Roman senator. <laughs> Crosby still wasn't done and said, Well, while we're on the subject of, uh, of appointing horses as senators, heaven knows that the Prime Minister of Canada has appointed enough horses as senators or perhaps, more properly speaking, one end of horses. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that, 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 that's half of my Newfoundland education, and the other half came on a stormy late winter day in uh, Winnipeg when Bishop uh, Harvey came to Winnipeg. Uh, he had served prior uh, for years, fruitfully. Do I remember, was it the Anglican Diocese of Eastern Newfoundland and Labrador? And Labrador. Okay, uh, but for reasons of conscience and a conviction a number of years ago, uh, uh, became then uh, the head of what here is known as the Anglican Network in Canada. I'm not always completely sure how that uh, fits on the flowchart uh, into the Anglican Church of North America, but I think I'll get an education during these days. We're very glad, Bishop Harvey, that you're here. Very glad you're still active and very glad that you've given us some of your time. So we welcome you now. I will forego the priorities of lords and ladies and so 
so I would simply say, dear friends, <laughs> one of the things that Newfoundlanders are noted for is that they are supposed to speak neither one of Canada's two official languages. <laughs> and with that label, I hope that I will not need a translator today. Uh, it's a joy to be back here in this room for the first time since 2004. I was here then for the General Synod, which as you've already heard was sort of a turning point in the lives of some of us who have been uh, cradle Anglicans in Canada. Uh, I was overwhelmed at that time by the generosity of our hosts. I had a lot to learn from many aspects. The group I was going to be representing were talking about walking out of Synod, and they said to me, we're appointing you as the quarterback. Now there's no uh, football as such in Newfoundland. I knew nothing of the terminology. <laughs> and I kept thinking throughout the whole thing, what's a quarterback supposed to do? <laughs> but my uh, learning curve became quite rapid after that. I was invited to become the bishop for the Anglican Essentials, which later came the Anglican Network in Canada. And uh, was told by the person who invited me that it might involve two or three meetings a year and a couple of phone calls. <laughs> Since that time, I have traveled by air uh, at least 100,000 miles each year, every year since then. I uh, have become a member of the uh, Air Canada Million Miles Club, uh, which, does, which sounds a lot better than it is, believe me. Uh, and um, so to come back and see, in a way, where it all starts gives me a, a, a great sense of nostalgia. I also had a marvelous experience in Vancouver when uh, one of our congregations, basically an ethnic Chinese congregation, was evicted uh, from its parish, which, parish church, which they had built, and uh, desperately fought, trying to find a place to go, again were offered the hospitality of the Lutheran congregation there. It was too far for me to, for them, me, to, to walk from that church uh, down to the Lutheran church maybe a couple, three miles on that highway. So what we decided to do was have a motorcade. And I was sitting in the front car, which had a sunroof in it. So they opened the sunroof. No, no I didn't get up through the sunroof. We put the cross up through the sunroof as we went down. We arrived at the church. I walked up the steps with my little flock behind me. I took my crow's ear and I hammered on the door three times. And the Lutheran pastor opened the door welcomed us in the name of Jesus Christ, and has been a, a remarkably, wonderfully happy relationship since then. Even made more wonderful by the fact that we're not just sharing the building, we're sharing some of the programs as well. And I may have the opportunity to talk about that tomorrow. At any rate, uh, it is good to be here, and I too have very fond memories with Dr. Bugby in, in Winnipeg. And by the way, from St. John's Newfoundland, it's closer to go to London, England, than it is to go even to Winnipeg, much less Vancouver. So it just gives us an idea of the breadth of this, of this continent uh, and our country. And I promise Dr. Buckley, if we have time again, I can really uh, give him a few more John Crosby stories, which will make the ones he uh, just told uh, tame. But that might, be, that might mean, though, you'd have to be very selective over the audience that you told. At any rate, my friends, uh, you may have noticed the title of my address, and that's the reason why I spoke about speaking neither of the official languages at the beginning. Uh, I thought about it, and the words on paper don't look quite the same. You have to prepare them. She's gone, by. She's gone. Gone! Bottom down right out of her. It is from that phrase, which I will elaborate on, uh, that I thought maybe uh, we'll give a little bit of uh, variety in the presentations here today. Whether it will be a successful uh, variety can be determined later on. When I began this not unpleasant task of preparing these remarks, I was comforted and relieved by two things. Firstly, there was the assurance by Dr. John, a previous speaker, that these presentations should be substantial 
but not academic. And I would be encouraged to draw on uh, your personal observations of over uh, 50 years in ordained ministry. During that half century, I did very little in the form of academic papers and discovered during the first few weeks working on this just how out of touch I had grown with this particular discipline. Indeed, looking back at some of my graduate work, uh, postgraduate work, uh, which I began when I was in my mid-40s, often finds me wondering if I really did these papers and the realization that it would take me quite a long time, if ever, now at my age, to get back into that style again. I knew most of my work was on British Romanticism and Wordsworth in particular, and uh, try as I might, I did not find any direct way to bring that into what I'm going to say. <laughs> However, one might observe that uh, there was uh, people in our profession, some of us are ordained, uh, and that uh, there's the weekly sermon. And during the last 20 years as a bishop, that usually was considerably more than just one sermon a week. However, while I always have admired those who could deliver a sermon or homily from a prepared text and make it appear as if they were composing it as they went along, that's a gift I never possessed. On the few important occasions when I felt, like this one, that I had to have greater control over what I was saying and so disciplined myself to putting it all on the page, I discovered that and I hope it's not going to be the case today, but I discovered that it nearly always came out as if I had picked up a book and was reading it out loud. It was stilted, flat, without much conviction, and simply, it was not me. I never was uh, pleased with these efforts, and as a result, I suppose, it must be 40 years since I actually wrote a sermon. Realizing just how important the proclamation of the word is in the role of the pastor, I found that I put at least as much, usually more time, into preparation as if I were actually transcribing it. And uh, during the week, there was not much waking time when some aspect of what I wanted to say was in my mind. And that has been the case here as well. But in the long run, I figured maybe I should try to reduce it to this particular uh, discipline with which I'm not terribly comfortable. Some of you know that I did my MA thesis on the great John Keeble, both as a theologian and as a poet. And so when a, a, a sermon went flat, or a presentation like this went flat, I took solace in, the re in retelling the comforting story of Keeble, told of him by no less than Newman, that while at Oxford, when told his sermons were drawing large numbers to church, for a number of weeks deliberately uh, preached poorly in a futile effort to draw the attention away from himself and place it on the Almighty, where he felt it should always be. So, whenever things went poorly for me in the pulpit, I would say, but I'm just taking an example from John Peter, <laughs> putting the example in the right place. I hope I won't have to say that at the end of the day, but who knows. Uh, some of you may recall the TV addresses back in the old black and white days of Bishop Fulton J. Sheehan uh, during the early days of the medium of television. He would do a lively 30-minute show without notes or teleprompter, or teleprompter had not been invented, they tell me, and all he had was a piece of chalk and, and a blackboard behind him. And when asked about this accomplishment, he would respond rather lightheartedly with, well, if I can't remember what I want to say, how can I expect my audience to remember it either? And that may be uh, some justification for off-the-cuff remarks. But all of this is by way of an apology in advance to explain that while I won't be sticking throughout uh, to, to a script, though uh, I, I do have this one in front of me to fall back on, should I suddenly go even more breakdown than usual, I do uh, make 
some points that need to be preserved, I will be able to knock these later into a proper paper should it be requested. So then here it is. She's gone by. She's gone. I come from Newfoundland, Canada's 10th province, youngest province, Britain's oldest colony, and was a dominion of its own until 1949. I was born in Newfoundland when I was 10 years old or so, I became a Canadian to no uh, desire or lack of desire on my own part. Although tiny on the map, it's the world's 10th largest island and for centuries had the world's largest fishing ground around its shores. Overfishing and poor management made an end to the claim that, that claim to fame and now offshore oil development have made at least temporary uh, relief from the economic devastation brought about by the collapse of the basic industry. For centuries, its inhabitants lived in isolated, tiny communities called outports around its rugged coastline, with the result that they were out of touch with much of what was happening in the rest of the world. Its culture, its language, particularly its dialect, and its gene pool are unique and distinctive to the extent that we have been studied to death by people coming from outside of our region to do research papers on us. Actually, I have a friend who applied from the federal government uh, for a grant to do a survey on people doing surveys. <laughs> <laughs> and he got it. It was awarded to him. Anyway, most of the fishers plied their trades in small wooden boats that were called dories, or punts, and they rowed to the nearby fishing ground. With the invention of the inboard motor, I'm not talking about the outboard one that we're so familiar with, but the inboard motor, uh, life changed considerably. They could go further from shore, they could launch out of the deep, and it took fewer people to maneuver, maneuver them. Propulsion came from a blade, a propeller, in the very stern, which also was where the rudder was located. Should that part of the craft become damaged through ice, not very far from where the Titanic went down actually, or through collision or rough water, the little boat became virtually unmanageable. And so the saying arose, she's gone by, the stern is gone right out of her. Rarely would the boat actually sink, but it became useless, unable to be propelled or navigated. And with the weight of the motor and the propeller, the traditional rowing became impossible also. You almost would be like Coleridge's uh, ancient mariner, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. But you either had to go back to your old boat or try to repair the one you were using. She's gone by was equivalent to saying she's finished. You would have to try something new. From that perspective, now try to picture two or more old fishermen sitting in front of a radio or television. The news rarely, as you know, is cheerful and often depicts the loss of something they would have cherished without even knowing that they had cherished it. One will look at the other. You shake his head and mutter, she's gone by. The bottom will go right out of her. And the other one replies, yes, my son, she's gone. They wouldn't say the bottom has gone out of her. They had more colorful language than that as well, but I leave that to your imagination. And now then, having given you that scenario, let me reflect on the church into which I was ordained in 1963. And on what has changed for the better? What has changed for the worse? What can be done to remedy, remedy it? And to what extent has the bottom gone right out of it? So, what was so different about the church of the 1960s? To begin with, at least superficially, it was a very male-dominated church. The annual congregation meeting was attended by men only, and they in turn elected the vestry from their numbers. 
There were no statutes of limitation, and it was not uncommon to find a warden in office for 30 or even 40 years. Men did the greeting at the door, when greetings did take place, and men passed a plate at the office. In those days, the clergy and lay readers were all male. Women's organizations did exist, but for the most part, they were auxiliaries involving fundraising and maintaining the sanctuary. Almost without exception, these leaders were patriarchs and matriarchs in the community, and many already attained the appellation of being called uncle or aunt, even if they were unmarried and childless. Unbaptized infants and suicides were buried outside of the churchyard fence, unconsecrated property. And a pregnant bride had her nuptials performed at the font, which was near the door of the church, without any music from the organ. No flowers, no bells, and in some cases not even a final blessing. When the baby was born, the mother could not be churched, as we used to call the service of the Thanksgiving after childhood. And the mother, in higher church parishes, was encouraged to make a private confession. It is interesting to note that all of these restrictions were aimed at the woman, while the man got off comparatively scot-free. And surprisingly, though, people subjected to this so-called discipline accepted it, and then went on later to become active members in the same parish in which they were apparently scorned. When I was a deacon in 1963, I attended my first annual meeting at the congregation. I was a curate there. Only men attended, and everyone was in their Sunday best. It wouldn't have been held on Sunday, by the way. That would be profaning the Lord's Day. The rector led in opening prayers, and then almost immediately we moved into reports on whatever was current at that time. Then came an interesting element. None of the men in that congregation had been in a position to assume the role of treasurer and had, uh, and, and had to engage, and so we had, the parish had to engage the wife of one of the wardens uh, to carry out that particular job of looking after the accounts. This woman, the wife of the warden, was a lady who carried herself well. She was president of the Women's Association, president of the local PTA, and in 1963, you could say she was an embryonic feminist. She had opinions on everything that went on in the community, the church, everywhere else, and believe me, she had no hesitation uh, in expressing them. During the congregational meeting, she sat outside until the appropriate time when someone came out and invited her to enter. Everyone stood politely, and she was given a chair next to the rector as at the head of the table. She gave a very positive report on the finances, this is 1963, mind you, and displayed two bank passbooks, which confirmed it all. She skillfully answered all of the questions put to her, and even some not put to her, uh, to everyone's satisfaction. And then the rector thanked her profusely, everyone applauded, and she was told she was now could be excused while the men got on with the business of running the church. She smiled sweetly, thanked us all for our cooperation, gathered up her papers and went back to the kitchen to help preparing the refreshments for men who, when finished the business of running the church, uh, Finished it up by the rector saying a blessing, and they all standing for a robust singing of God saying the Queen, during which everyone stood rigidly at attention. I am certain, though, that this woman saw absolutely nothing wrong or out of place with all that transpired. She accepted it as the way things were ordained to be. Meanwhile, I never have forgotten it. But at times when I look around the scene today, I wonder if that really happened. Now I realize, friends, I have lingered 
longer on this reflection of the good old days than may be deemed appropriate or necessary in such a paper. But as I will now try to point out, it was situations such as these that made the ground so fertile for the rapid changes that were so soon to fall. Newfoundland may have been unique in some aspects, and certainly its demographics made it a relatively easy area to study, as I've suggested. Still, over the years, uh, following ordination in 63, I came to realize that we were not nearly as distinctive a culture as we may all, as we often thought we were. This is especially so when we compare it with other rural areas across the land, uh, and not with places like Toronto, Montreal, or Vancouver, for example. I recall being enthralled years ago with a couple of books by Harry J. Boyle, mostly in clover was one, and homebrew and patches was the other. And in those little books, discovering just how similar was life in rural Newfoundland to life in northern Ontario and Manitoba. You see, in my time, you could enter seminary. No, I'm sorry, I repeat. In my time, you could not enter seminary if you were married, unless you were widowed, I suppose. And when you emerged, new clerical collar and all, you had a large suitcase packed with everything a young bachelor cleric would need. However, the label as to where you were going was left blank until you awaited the sometimes dreaded meeting with the bishop, uh, usually the Saturday prior to Sunday's ordination. It would be unheard of and professionally faithful, the fatal, to demur from the from accepting what you were offered, uh, but really uh, were assigned. I remember seeing a letter by the bishop who ordained me to a colleague of mine saying, My dear so and so, I wonder if you would be good enough to take up residence in the parish of such and such. I have already booked your passage on the boat and uh, arranged for your children to attend the school. So it wasn't so much a <coughs> I wonder if you as please be there. Some of us uh, often try what I used to call the old Briar Pack syndrome. Send me anywhere, but don't send me to such and such a place. And sometimes it worked, but other times it backfired on you as well. <laughs> <laughs> now to the serious part. And bringing in uh, what I believe, what I've said before, is preparing the fertile ground. When a new priest, pastor, <coughs> arrived in the new parish, the fact that he was ordained and sent by the bishop automatically put him in a special status that he did not have to earn. True, he could lose the status, and many of them often did, but it was there. Society and culture was such uh, that you found that you were the person, literally the person, to whom people would tip their hats, and small children would shrink away uh, in awe when you came into their presence. You baptized almost 100% of the babies born. At the time of Confederation in 49, the Newfoundland birth rate was even higher than that in Quebec, especially when they discovered the joy of family allowances, or baby bonuses as they call them. And all these babies, this ties in with what Dr. John was giving in his statistics in England, of the, uh, 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 even much later. <coughs> Of these babies you baptized, at least 85% of them, 10 years later, would be you would prepare for confirmation, which seemed to be a mandatory rite of passage. Until the 1970s, in Newfoundland, all marriages had to be performed by a religious body, and it was extremely rare uh, for a corpse to be laid to rest without the comforting words of Holy Mother Church. It was a society centered around the church one way or the other. <coughs> when
When I celebrated my various anniversaries of birth and ordination in the last decade or so, I frequently am asked the question, have you seen many changes in the church over these years? To which I always answer that the church in which I was ordained is hardly recognizable as the same church today. When I say that, most people uh, think I again am giving way to hyperbole, with which I have been noted too from time to time. But sadly, uh, though sadly about this, I've never been more honest than I have when I made this observation. When I ask those who agree with me, <coughs> and this is one area where they generally do, what has made the church life and membership so different and seemingly insignificant, I often get answers such as materialism, secularism, indifference, and even atheism. In the last few years, I sometimes get appeasing Islam uh, added to that list as well. While I believe they are spot on with many of these answers, I still am confused over how much rampant change, how such rampant change could take place in so short a time. As to whether there is a solution or a remedy, most feel we are so caught up in the spirit of the age, the culture, the secular culture, that the Christian church may well become obsolete in a few decades. Such predictions, as you know, are not new. Bishop Samuel Wilberforce, Soapy Sam, as he was sometimes called, by friends as well as opponents, in 1859, after reading Darwin's latest contribution on the origin of the species, gave the church another 25 years of existence. An unfortunate fall from his horse resulted in him not being around in 25 years to determine whether he had been prophetic or not. And there is that uh, other phase, which many often find comforting, phrase that people find comforting, that the church always has been one generation away from extinction. And still it plods on, because as we are aware, as we have been promised, the very gates of hell or of Hades will not prevail against it. Dr. John has been very helpful in steering me to some of the books he steered you to this morning. The most interesting and insightful is the book, uh, The Death of Christian Britain, which he has already talked about by Callum G. Brown. If you want a copy, try and get it from a library. If you go to Amazon, it will spoil $100 on you, even though it's still well worth reading. While it deals with Great Britain, and does not go beyond the year 2000, almost all of his conclusions now apply to the North American scene, and it is a very useful source to those who want to delve even further into that field of study. Most of his opinions, or most of his conclusions, in my opinion, are axiomatic. We see so many examples around us. I recall not many years ago, a CBC reporter, uh, thinking his microphone was turned off, uh, said, and it wasn't, said the Lord's name in vain, and he was fired, not just reprimanded, but fired within 24 hours. If we see other examples of the, uh, the great breakthrough Secularists would certainly say with the trial uh, uh, of the book uh, Lady Shatterley's Lover, which now is on any Smith bookshelf and uh, nothing much about it at all, that was epoch changing. And uh, uh, particularly the high debate that went on over a certain four letter word, uh, beginning with the letter F, uh, which uh, really uh, went into such depths and caught the headlines so much that it tied in with the, the changes that were then taking place. 
You see, on uh, uh, reflection, I think that I have been trying to follow Brown's example of depicting how things were, albeit on a far different canvas when I think uh, rural Newfoundland, and then how they are now and how they may be becoming. The major question he raises is not how did this come about in so relatively short a time. He suggests the major decline began in the 1970s and is continuing at an increasingly alarming rate now. And Dr. John, uh, Dr. John's figure certainly gave rise to that and supported that as well. And so we find ourselves saying, you know, has the train already left the station and is gathering speed as it heads toward a washout trestle? Or, as we have been fond of saying just a few years ago, in my jurisdiction, is the toothpaste already out of the tube? You know, as a university student, I recall going to the library to get a, a copy of, uh, of, of, of a particular book, uh, Ulysses by James Joyce, being sent back to my professor to get a letter, almost like a prescription. This student is allowed to borrow this book. And I recall getting the book and uh, almost automatically turning to the last chapter, the soliloquy of Molly Bloom. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's a stream of consciousness that is very vivid. And I'm not going to be dishonest enough to say that it was simply for the literary qualities that I wanted to read Ulysses. But I will say that when I got to the offending pages, they had been excised from the book completely. Not by some sex crazed undergraduate who wanted them and couldn't afford to photocopy. They had been removed by the librarian herself because uh, that book at that time uh, was on the index of the Roman Catholic Church. You see, in the 1970s, I already was in parish ministry for a decade or more, and it occurs to me with disbelief and alarm that the advance of militant secularism took place during my watch. Was I so blind as not to see an advancing, and even more alarming, what, if anything, did I or any of my colleagues do to reverse this onslaught? You know, we try to pinpoint as we get chatting uh, as to just what it was. Some people would say, oh, it was getting rid of the Book of Common Prayer. Some people were getting rid of the old-fashioned catechism. All of those things. But I don't think that any of those individual things was what brought this on. On further reflection, I would suggest that there is nothing surprising about the fact that, that, that the secularism we are now discussing is militant. While it, became, while it began by being somewhat subtle, encouraged by its success, it has come out of the shadows and now almost boasts, not almost, it does boast about its progress. Just let me once more come back to Newfoundland again. During my childhood adolescence and even in earlier years of ordained ministry, the observance of the Lord's Day was rigid to the degree that we would call, I suppose, sabbatarian. Shopping was unheard of, and only the most essential chores were performed. Much preparation was made on Saturday. The vegetables were peeled, the fuel was gathered in, shoes were polished for the service the next day, and every competent housewife was made sure that she scrubbed her floors. Uh, on, on the Saturday evening. Sporting events, believe me, but I tell you, sporting events on Sunday were unheard of. And children could not go uh, sledding or skating or skiing, uh, and in the strictest households, uh, participate in para games even on that particular day. Sometimes reminds me of, of, of Wuthering Heights, uh, Heathcliff and Kathy being in the room with uh, old Joseph, giving them books of the uh, various uh, church leaders prominent that I tried to read, and nothing else. I'm not painting the extreme when I gave you that description, but rather what was normal in the average household. Now the extreme, if you want an extreme, would be the young woman I knew personally, 
who discovered that the button was dangling from her coat just as she was getting ready to go to church on Sunday evening. And so she dutifully sat down and so on. As soon as the service was over and she returned home, she immediately snipped it off again. And then on Monday morning, I fixed it for the second time because uh, she only did it on the Lord's Day in order to get to church. While there were aspects of all of this that we now laugh at, I thought you would laugh more at it, but uh, anyway. Uh, and, and they may even seem silly to us. I still think that as misguided as it may now seem, there was still something very special about the intimate way they felt that they had to observe the words, remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day, and with the phrase, in it, in it thou shalt do no man but work. Nevertheless, it was providing fertile ground, these restrictions, for sectarianism to set in. Suffice it to say that in the vast majority of Anglican homes, and I expect many other Christian homes are not much different, Sunday now is treated like any other day of the week, and trying to determine when and how this so obvious change, this dramatic change, took place on, on a relatively minor issue in the grand scheme of things may give some indication as to its evolution on the major playing fields, though pun intended, of Sunday sports that we are exploring. We are familiar with, and most of us often have used the illustration of that wretched frog sitting in a kettle of water. We've been told, no way of knowing if this is true, I don't want to experiment. We've been told that if you heat the water slowly enough, that poor creature will actually boil to death without feeling any discomfort. The secret is all in the timing, and the emphasis is on it being gradual. I find even more telling is the simple illustration of a passenger jet being hijacked. The hijackers were clever enough to dress like the crew. They spoke like the crew, and until their intentions became apparent, they mingled among the passengers as if all was normal. Then the Stockholm Syndrome began to set in, and many of the passengers began to emphasize, empathize with and even support they're very hijackers. After 9-11, all major nations assembled on the first convenient occasion to commemorate those tragic events. Here in Canada, the memorial took place on Parliament Hill, and all political parties assembled with the public to reflect on this episode that had changed all of our lives forever. The decision went out from none less than the office of the Prime Minister himself that this service was to have uh, no scripture read, no prayers of any sort to be offered, which showed so very clearly just how militant the secularism had become to the exclusion of the very principles upon which this nation had been built. And although a few voices uh, went through the motions of criticizing what was happening, it turned out there it was a very feeble protest indeed. Newfoundland, as you have been told, is the most easterly point in North America. And again, the government deemed it appropriate to have the sunrise service at its most easterly point at dawn on January the 1st, 2000, to properly greet the millennium. Each church was invited to attend a meeting to prepare for this historic event, after which my appointee came to my office to tell me that they had been expressly forbidden in their plans to mention the name of Jesus Christ. The fact that this uh, was commemorating 2,000 years of his birth <laughs> was immaterial, and he was not even to be accorded an honorable mention. Under the premise that many of you may have used over the years, under the premise that it is easier to get forgiveness than it is to get permission, 
uh, I arranged uh, that the final benediction would be in the name of the Blessed Trinity. A similar thing happened in the year disaster at Peggy's Cove, and I've lost count of the number of times I have refused to give an invocation at a convention or a grace at a banquet when part of the instruction was that the prayer was to be generic with no mention of Jesus Christ. All of this is happening in a nation whose motto on the coat of arms is his dominion shall be from sea to sea. I so often am reminded of Elijah's showdown with the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings 18.21. In fact, I mentioned it last Sunday because we were two were using the, the common lectionary and I was talking about the poor fellow who came in without a wedding garment. King said, Friend, why comest thou with hither without a garment? And he was speechless. Elijah came near to the people, the good book says, and said, How long will you go limping after two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if they follow him. And then this tragic comment, but the people did not answer him a word. And I'm suggesting that it is that kind of silence that has uh, helped to do anything but thwart the events of this militant secularism today. So let me finish by. saying that I would really type this intrusive rather than militant secularism. But whether I call it militant or, or, or intrusive, the bottom line turns out to be the same. I could attribute much of this to four influences. One, political correctness carried to an insane degree that we have experienced. Number two, apathy. Or indifference. Number three, extreme Islamic aggression. And number four, I don't whether I should say that in this setting or not, but I believe it's the failure of the theological colleges. Political correctness, like so many things, stemmed from a genuine need, and then it went right, both in church and in culture, until, like Iago's description of, of, of jealousy became the green-eyed monster that does mock the meat it feeds on. When it degenerates to not being able to refer to the right hand of God, for example, because that would be offensive to left-handed people, we realize just how cramped and cautious our mode of expressing ourselves, so we won't offend anyone, really has become. And with not being able to use the language to its capacity, we find that uh, much is left unsaid. Apathy or indifference is one of the besetting sins of the current culture. Nor is it new. Some of you may know that delightful poem by Jeffrey Stuttart Kennedy, you know, Woodbine Willie. When Jesus came to Golgotha, they hanged him on a tree. They drove great nails through hands and feet and made a calvary. They crowned it with a crown of thorns, red were his wounds and feet. Those were crude and cruel days that human flesh was cheap. When Jesus came to our town, we only passed him by. We didn't hurt a hair of him. We only let him die, for we had grown more tender and it would not cause him pain. We just went down the street and left him in the rain. Still Jesus cried, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Still it rained, the wintry rain that drenched him through and through. The crowds went home and left the streets without a soul to see. And Jesus crouched beside a wall and cried for Calvary. Now words like, so what? Whatever. <laughs> 
or most recently real <coughs> problem, have been adopted in everyday practice, <coughs> indicative of a generation who feel they can or should hear less. That, friends, is very fertile ground for secularism, not just to take root in, but to flourish and easily become militant. The threat of Islam is relatively new in the way we find it among our concerns, but shows every sign of perhaps being the most militant of all the factors, especially and tragically so and with the cooperation of fellow Christians who have given birth to Chrislam, which suggests that both Christianity, Christianity and Islam are similar enough not just to coexist, but eventually to combine. And that is tragic, but that is serious. Finally, when I make these comments on the failure of theological schools and seminaries, I am only familiar with the Anglican colleges in Canada, in particular, to some degree, in the United States. Uh, one of the major problems in our diocese now, in the Anglican network in Canada, is the challenge to find a seminary, hopefully in Canada, in which our students can be properly trained for ordination. There may be a number, indeed there are a number of very orthodox Bible colleges, but an institution that can prepare people to ordain ministry within a context of Anglican polity presently does not exist in our own country. Indeed, over the last five years, I have repeated constantly that our theological college has got us into this mess we are in today, and their approach to sound theology has been lacking to a dreadful degree. It breeds a vicious cycle of repetitive watered-down recognition of, if not an outright rejection of, the, the, the claim that Holy Scripture contains all things necessary to salvation. And on my last page, less than a general attitude that it is old and possibly bad theology. And if, if something is old, it probably now is bad and outdated. And if new, more than likely it's going to be good. Behind it all are the insidious tentacles of secularism infiltrating the faith once delivered to the saints. I say again that the theological colleges in Canada are responsible for getting us into this mess and I continue to call for them to try to rectify it. As I write this, and this has been referred to in the last talk, Pope Francis is behind closed doors with church leaders grappling with making a 21st century pastoral response to age-old moral dilemmas. The preliminary report suggests that it may well be a revolutionary document, at least that's the hints we were given last weekend, a revolutionary document that will be welcomed by the liberal wing of that church and already has been decried uh, by the conservatives. We pray for discernment that the changes made, if they are made, will have the guidance of the Holy Spirit and that they will not be a result of the secularism from which that church, like most of our churches, is being attacked. And lastly, I deliver this paper on the 16th of October. And as I do so, I note that in some of our calendars, today commemorates Latimer, at Ridley, the Oxford Martyrs. As they both were ending their lives so painfully at the stake, with poor Cranmer, soon to follow them, forced to watch what was happening through a window. <clears throat> Hugh Latimer supposedly says to his companion, Nicholas Ridgely, be of good comfort and play the man, Master Ridgely. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as never shall be put out. Friends, that happened in that 
marketplace in Oxford 459 years ago this very day. Whether we agree with the positions they held is debatable, and in some ways is of little consequence. The fact is that they were given the courage to stand against what they perceived to be wrong and contrary to the word of God. And I plead, may such courage of our convictions not be found lacking today in what seems like an unstoppable movement attacking the church from without and within will in fact be put in this place and we again can be able to claim the gates of hell have not prevailed against it. Thank you very much.